First readings from Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, reading from verse 11. Judges chapter 6, reading from verse 11 down to verse 18. Let's hear now the word of God. Then the Lord's angel came to the village of Ophrah and sat under the oak tree that belonged to Joash, a man of the clan of Abiezer. His son Gideon was threshing some wheat secretly in a wine press so that the Midianites wouldn't see him. The Lord's angel appeared to him there and said, The Lord is with you, brave and mighty man. Gideon said to him, If I may ask, sir, why has all this happened to us if the Lord is with us? What about all the wonderful things that our fathers told us the Lord used to do? How he brought them out of Egypt. The Lord has abandoned us and left us to the mercy of the Midianites. And the Lord ordered him, Go with all your great strength and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I myself am sending you. Gideon replied, But Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least important member of my family. The Lord answered, You can do it because I will help you. You will crush the Midianites as easily as if there were only one man. Gideon replied, If you're pleased with me, give me some proof that you are really the Lord. Please don't leave until I bring you an offering of food. He said, I will stay until you come back. Our second reading is from Ephesians 3, reading from verse 1 down to 13. Ephesians 3, 1 to 13. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, pray to God. Surely you have heard that God in his grace has given me this work to do for your good. God revealed his secret plan and made it known to me. I have written briefly about this, and if you will read what I have written, you can learn about my understanding of the secret of Christ. In past times, human beings were not told this secret. But God has revealed it now by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. The secret is that by means of the gospel, the Gentiles have a part with the Jews in God's blessings. They are members of the same body and share in the promise that God made through Christ Jesus. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. God did this according to his eternal purpose, which he achieved through Christ Jesus our Lord. In union with Christ and through our faith in him, we have the boldness to go into God's presence with all confidence. I beg you then not to be discouraged because I am suffering for you. It is all for your benefit. It was shared with you yesterday the news of what uh, Clive and I are going to get up to this year. We're talking tonight about mission, and I think we need to look into our hearts as to how ready we are to obey what God says. I had very preconceived ideas of what God was going to do with me, and it certainly, certainly, certainly never included America. I would not dream of that. Africa, India, if God was taking me out of this country, but never America. We told God quite happily that we would move, if that's what he wanted, in 1998. 
As far as I know, this year is not 1998, I think it's 1997. So when we look at this idea tonight of mission, what is God saying to us? And let's get rid of some of those preconceived ideas of how God might use us, because it might not be his agenda for us. I can never say that the last 25 years has been boring living with Clive. I never know what's going to happen next. But it's been exciting, and only God knows what the future holds. Will you give a welcome to my best friend, Clive? They cooked that up behind my back. <clears throat> Thank you, Ruthie. The subject is mission. The uh, passage is Ephesians 3, but uh, I, I just want to take you back in time for a bit first. I want you to go back with me some 19 years. When 1.8% uh, of the population were evangelical Christians. When we were still singing from youth praise. And uh, in 1978, uh, a fairly long-haired musician, about there, and a, an equally long-haired preacher, that was me, the musician was Graham Kendrick, went on the road together as we usually did, but the purpose was a little different. You see, uh, we wanted to have a conference, a conference on evangelism, and uh, no one was booking. And Graham and I got something we wanted to say anyway. And so we took one of these nice, gentle, laid-back, friendly Christian road shows on the road. It was called Fighter. <laughs> Graham is one of the most gentle people you can meet until he's worked up about something. And he only really gets worked up if it's something to do with God. And uh, every night Graham would go through a set with the band. And then when he finished, he would sing this. And this was my introduction. I then had to come on and preach, then make the appeal, and uh, then Graham would sing again. And uh, the, the song went like this. I'm not going to sing it to you, you're okay. <laughs> How can we fail to get excited? The battle is ours, why don't we fight it? Battalions of darkness rise above me, but God put a fighter in me. Listen and you'll hear the sweetest sound you ever heard in England. It's the spirit moving across the land. It's the voice of one who calls his bride to come and to be ready. Gentle as a dove, he comes with fire. Where have all the Christian soldiers gone? Where is the resistance? Will no one be strong? When will we rise up tall and straight, stand up and storm the gates? How can we fail to get excited? The battle is ours, why don't we fight it? Battalions of darkness rise above me, but God put a fighter in me. Imagine preaching after that, it's quite difficult. The conference was Spring Harvest. 2,700 people gathered in North Wales, and for the last few years it's been 70 to 80,000. Now you're not 1.8% of the population anymore, now you're 7%. You're not living in the aftermath of 100 years of decline, you're now growing. You are now doing things you would never have dreamt of doing in those days. Uh, some of you aren't even wearing sports jackets to church, it's now jumpers. And you are even smiling. <laughs> Which I always tell the media is the time that God really started to move. And when we started just to, be rela to relax and be ourselves in Jesus. And so tonight what I want to do is I want to give you part two of the fighter sermon. The part that I never preached. Because part one was how do you rise up in God and take a land for Jesus. Part two is how do you rise up in God and take a world for Jesus. Because it was only when an ex-ambassador, guy who had just taken early retirement as a US ambassador, rang me up and said, would you and Ruth come over from Britain and help us? Which is not the kind of thing you ever expect to hear. Because most Americans are pretty confident people. You don't expect the words, will you come from Britain and help us? And when we heard that, the writing was on the wall, really. 
but it does give me a qualification to, to do something I've never had the qualification to do before. And that's to talk about how we're going to get this world back for Jesus. Fighter, part two. And there in Ephesians chapter three, you've got the, uh, the basic outline in the passage. And I want to give you three points, but the first one comes in three divisions, so if you're taking notes, it's quite straightforward. You see, firstly, the secret of the missionary. What is the secret of the missionary? Well, first of all, it's to be a prisoner, and you get that in verse 1. Now, humanly, Paul was not Christ's prisoner, but he was Nero's. In Acts 25, we read that he'd appealed to the emperor, and he was committed to trial. But Paul doesn't think in human terms. He's a prisoner of Jesus. He belongs to someone else. So he has a different purpose. He's not Nero's prisoner. He's Christ's prisoner. And if you want to be a missionary, you've got to be a prisoner. A prisoner not of people, but a prisoner of Jesus. You've got to be captivated by the lovely face of Jesus. You've got to be entranced by the lovely name of Jesus. You've got to be prepared to belong to Jesus, body, soul, and spirit. Because that's what it really means to belong to the family. You have to be a slave, a servant. Or the word I like most, you have to be a prisoner, captivated by the King of Kings. That means it's not enough to celebrate, although it's great to celebrate. You celebrate to go and serve and you serve to come back and celebrate. That's why it's not enough to have health and wealth and what the world offers. That's why at the end of the day, you have to just belong. Because sometimes when you're a prisoner, you don't get what you want. Sometimes when a prisoner, you get the opposite. I hear too many preachers today saying, this you'll be given, this you'll be given, this you'll be given. It seems to me that we have lost the word sacrifice, which we need to recover again. I haven't warned him about this, and I hope he'll forgive me. But if you look at Alex Buchanan on the platform here, who often stands and shares from his heart what God has given him, you may wonder where Alex gets his ideas from. I'm going to let you into his secret tonight. You see, you will see his wife Peggy going around in a chair because she has MS. And if you say, how can you talk about them like this? It's because really they are my surrogate dad and mum. They have looked after me for years. Alex has been my pastor nationally for over 20 years, so I know I can talk about him and just about get away with it. Also, I guess after 23 years, there's not much he doesn't know about me. But you will notice with Alex that Alex is deaf. Stone deaf in one ear, three quarters deaf in the other. So when you look at this lovely couple who God uses so much, you may say, why on earth hasn't God healed them yet? Well, you see, they've been prayed for by the best in the land. So I said to Alex one day, you've been prayed for by so many. Why hasn't God healed you? Why are you deaf? And he looked at me and said, probably, dear brother, so that I can't listen to you. <laughs> True? But you see, there's something else to that. That's how you can listen to God. Because Alex can't listen to many other people. It's called being a prisoner. I thought we were supposed to have everything go easy. I suppose everything is supposed to go well for a Christian. Well, read Paul's testimony. Shipwrecks, disasters, half dead, stoned, in prison. Servant of Jesus, prisoner for Christ. You want to be a missionary? The first part of the secret is you've got to be a prisoner. Second part of the secret you get in verse 7 of Ephesians 3. It's not the easiest passage to get the subject of mission out of. It wasn't my idea. <laughs> but in verse 7, you find that uh, you've got to be a minister. Or as the NIV has it, a servant. But a minister is a I think a better translation of the word, to become a minister of this gospel by God's gift. 
In other words, we've all got a ministry entrusted to us. A ministry not for us, but to give away. Not for us to absorb, but to be given to somebody else. One of the reasons I don't like this venue is we're too high up. And that's not a good principle in the body of Christ. You see, when you look at these folks on the platform, I don't know what your reaction is. You may first of all think they're a good indication of God's sense of humour. <laughs> and I would agree with that. You might secondly think that they are due greater respect than you are. I have some problems with that one. You see, I really don't like the phrase full-time Christian service. Because if you've given your life to Jesus, you're in full-time Christian service. And there isn't any such thing as not being in full-time Christian service. So you're all ministers of the gospel. So you're all missionaries. And it's just in God's special favor, he takes the cream of the crop and he makes full-time Christian factory workers, full-time Christian bank clerks, full-time Christian students, full-time Christian housewives, full-time Christian businessmen. And those he can't find anything else for, he makes full-time Christian preachers. Now you may say you're not honouring your friends. Well, I'll honour them because they're wonderful people in God. They're consistent with the ministry they've been given, but they're not your superiors as people. They're your brothers and sisters. Yes, there are times you have to pay them on it, but there are many times they have to pay you on it. You see, we've got a problem in the body of Christ. We tend to take our professionals and think they become apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers wrapped up in one. When I think all your local vicar, stroke, pastor, stroke, elder is, is a shepherd for you. Someone to look after you, bless you, encourage you, and help you. When you want to ask who the real missionaries are, who's going to go and take this world for Jesus, it's you lot, not us. You see, we're only there to help you to do it. Why is that? Because you've got the contact, we haven't. You may say, oh, we'll try and bring them to you. Oh, no, 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 hang on just a minute. Most great teachers and pastors are not good evangelists. Most of the good evangelists are the people who have the real experience of what it's like to be in the real world. And if you're out there, you've got the best experience. You go and do the evangelism, what you don't make, bring to us and we'll try and sweep up what's left. But the real heart of evangelism should not be done in the church building, ever. The, the early church grew more rapidly pro rata than at any other time in its history, even today. The real mega growth was in those first years when they didn't have any buildings for 300 years. When they got buildings, they started to, to slow down. Because the problem with the building is it puts the focus on the professional and the building. When Jesus didn't die for professionals and buildings, he died for a body. And you're the body of Christ and individually members of it. You get that in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27. So we've all got a role, we've all got a ministry, we've all got a part to play, we're all there to be prisoners and to be missionaries in the work of the King and His Kingdom. That's our job, every one of us. Our place and our location is different. I've got a friend who's a banker and he's a great preacher. And one thing he wants to do is be a preacher. And for the last five years I've put quality time into stopping him becoming a preacher. You know, say, so why have you done that? Well, I've done that because as I said to him once, I said, Ken, the whole problem is God's got a lot of vicars, but he's a bit short of bankers. <laughs> so he gulped a bit, and he's still there, which is wonderful. And I mean, it, it's a good thing, because he is a vice chairman of Warburg's. The merchant bankers, we haven't got many of that caliber. Hey, can I tell you a story? Yeah. It's all right, I mean, I shouldn't, but... <laughs> Minehead last year. Uh, S.G. Warburg's have got a problem, and they called a, a meeting of all... Uh, they're top guys, and, and Ken must be sort of right at the top of the top of the top. Um, he's their international chairman, so they, uh, they, they rang up the local helicopter company at Minehead and said, we need our vice chairman, will you fly him up to us? They said, fine, where is he? And Warburg said, at Butlins. Three hours later, Warburg's rang again and said, where's our vice chairman? They said, well, it is April the 1st. We thought you were joking, Butlins. 
come on, folks. These are great people. Love them, pray for them, share them, cosset them, look after them, mow the lawn for them, send them on holiday, do that kind of thing as they bless you, but never get the idea that they're the answer in the body of Christ. We all are together. We've all got a role. We've all got a function. We've all got a ministry. And we all got to get on with it. Nor do we do it in our own strength. Paul says in verse 7, it's by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. It's God's grace and it's God's power at work in us. You don't even have to do it yourself. You just have to be a vehicle for Jesus. You'll probably never know what he does through you. You probably wouldn't be able to guess. But Corrie ten Boom, that lovely old Dutch saint of God, said before she died, when I enter that beautiful city, the New Jerusalem, and the saints all around me appear. Hey, I hope that somebody will tell me it was you who invited me here. Folks, we've all got a role. The secret of the missionary is to be a prisoner, the secret of the missionary is to act as a minister, and the secret of the, minist- of the missionary is to share an open secret. You get that in verse 6. Our job is to make known the mystery. So what is the mystery? Well, again in verse 6, it's a message to share. It's a revelation. In verse 7, it's a commission, it's a challenge to make Christ known. Now, the English word mystery means something obscure, strange, or or secret. Now, in Greek, mysterion, uh, the word mystery, is something unknown to humankind, but made by God into an open secret. In the first century mystery religions, the word meant private knowledge known only to initiates. In the church, mystery is revealed truth opened up by the Holy Spirit to every one of us. That's in verse 5. There isn't any private knowledge on this platform. There's no special secrets. We've all been given the mystery of the knowledge of Christ and what he does and who he is in God's word. And what is this specific mystery? Well, in verse 4, it's about Jesus. The mystery in verse 5 is opened up by the Holy Spirit. But what that mystery is, is that Jews and Gentiles who are in union with Christ are united to God and to each other. And this is the fantastic message we've got to proclaim. Gentiles can know God. Gentiles can love God. Gentiles can meet God. Gentiles can find God. Gentiles will spend eternity with God. And it's a jolly good job because there aren't many of us of Jewish origin here. Those who are, you had a head start on us, but we caught up, folks. We're now running neck and neck together, if together we know Jesus. And this mystery, Paul says in these lovely words in verse 6, Paul says that the mystery is that God will change our lives. We Jews and Gentiles are one together in the mystery, in the promise. And Paul uses three words. He says, we are simply renoma. We are co-heirs together, Jews and Gentiles. Paul says, we are sisoma. We are concorporate together. And Paul says, we are simitoka, co-sharers of God's promise. And this, he says, is good news. Because God's already said in the Old Testament that he'd got a purpose for the Gentiles. He said Israel would be a light to the nations. He said all nations would be blessed through Abraham's inheritance. He said the Messiah would inherit the nations. But nowhere was it shown that God's plan was as radical as this. Because no longer is he just going to rule over the Jewish nation. The church is now going to be the body of Christ united to Jesus. Jews and Gentiles completely equal. It's no longer a mystery. It's the gospel. It's good news and it's there to be proclaimed. The secret of uh, of the missionary to be a prisoner, a prisoner of Jesus. The secret of the, uh, of the missionary, to be a minister for Jesus in whatever place he puts us. The secret of the missionary is to make known the mystery, to make known the gospel. And it's a mystery out there to most people. And they need to know who Jesus is. I had the great privilege a few months ago of going to a, a, a naval town in northern Florida called Pensacola. I went to Pensacola on a specific job. I wanted to meet an evangelist who was seeing great blessing uh, in his preaching at a particular town in uh, Brownsville uh, within Pensacola. And I went to this Pentecostal church, or I was trying to find it, 
And I was with my oldest son, Chris, and I stopped the car and put on my best East End accent outside a, a supermarket. There was just a common Joe on the street there, and I said, look, mate, sorry to bother you, I'm British. Can you tell me where the church is? It may sound a bit odd, I'm looking for a church. Well, it was a bit odd, you see, because there were five on that street. <laughs> he said, oh, the one you want is straight down the block. Go across the road, past the next block, and you can't miss it, you'll see all the cars. So we, we drove down there, Chris and I. It was a Wednesday night. It was uh, uh, two and a half hours before the meeting was due to start, and the queue was over a thousand already. When we got into uh, to the actual meeting, I mean, it is quite unusual to see a church totally packed to the doors, grown men beating on the doors trying to get in, because they want to find Jesus. A four and a half hour service before the ministry starts. You didn't know you got let off so easily here, did you? <laughs> When the appeal was made, grown men were running to the front to meet Jesus. The week before, they had the sheriff in there. They took him to the youth meeting and they had a big skip in the middle of it, which they filled with bottles, knives, weapons, needles, illegal substances, porn magazines, pistols. And the sheriff took one look at this and kids meeting Jesus and said, up until now, I thought the major influence of this revival on the community was the traffic jams. Now I can see differently. Oh, by the way, the crime rate's gone down alarmingly since you lot started. They have so far had 125,000 conversions in 22 months. That's a conservative estimate. What's happening? It's what we call revival. It's people meeting Jesus because they're discovering the mystery. It's ordinary folks who've been transformed by the power of an extraordinary God and are getting on with the job. And the beauty of that is some people say we are into revival in this country now. I don't believe it. I had to preach at the Keswick Convention three years ago. Two years ago. And I, I uh, as I have to again this year, it's always a privilege. Went from there south and I had to preach for Holy Trinity Brompton, who'd got a week away at Morecambe, a couple of thousand of them. Now I need to explain to you that preaching at the Keswick Convention and preaching for Holy Trinity Brompton is not quite the same thing. <laughs> it's a bit like an exercise in spiritual schizophrenia. <laughs> you get equally blessed but in different ways. And there I was at HTB, and I quietly explained, because the vicar Sandy Miller is a good friend, I said, this isn't revival, folks. You see, revival is when people in their hundreds and thousands are meeting Jesus for the first time. It's not an awakening, because an awakening is when a society is being turned inside out and back to front. But it's probably part of a renewal, which has been going on for 20 years where God takes his people and turns us inside out, upside down and back to front, so we're ready for the next bit. Because there's never been a revival or an awakening in history that hasn't started in renewal. And what God begins with his people, he wants to move on from there. I'll tell you my fear. David Pawson said it 15 years ago. He said, if we're not careful, all we'll have left of a major move of God is repetitive chorus singing and the memory of what might have been. Folks, I believe we're on the brink of something special. I think the great danger is that the people of God are satisfied with it. And if I've got something that I continue to say, don't get me wrong, this is not negative one iota. I am entirely blessed and thrilled with everything that God does in such a variety of ways with all the variety of his people. That is not a problem to me. My problem is that we want to be blessed when God wants to bless us so we can give the blessing away. My great problem is that we get satisfied when we get blessed and my cry to the Lord is, if this is what we've gone for all these years for, frankly, Lord, it is not enough. I don't just want to see your people blessed. I want to see hundreds and thousands added to your kingdom and then I want to see this society changed by the love of Jesus. So we have seen something begin and that's all. 
That's the secret of the missionary. Let me move now, secondly, my second proper point is the size of the missionary. If I got Andy Au out here, you could see the difference. That's absolutely fine. You put it next to Ian Barclay and it's an interesting distinctive. But Andy is in the best company because Paul says he is the very least of all the saints in verse 8. The meanest member of the holy people. And he takes in the Greek the superlative. Elarchis totaros, the leastest. Terrible English. The less than the least. Paulus, his name in Latin means little or small. Tradition says that Paul was a little man, small in stature. All good things come in small passes. In saying he was little by name and little by stature, he's not being a Uriah Heap. Paul knows he's a failure. Paul knows he's persecuted the church. And yet now he's an apostle. He might be small, God's made him great. He didn't make himself great. You see, God wants those who will trust him. God doesn't want those who are trying to build themselves up. God wants those who will go out on a limb and risk it. One of the great problems in Christian work, so-called, is that you get to enjoy it, and you don't want to risk it. I have a good friend, a guy named Nick uh, Masupi. Uh, it's a good Anglo-Saxon name. <laughs> Nick Masupi comes from Soweto. Do you know Nick? Never met him. He's a superb preacher. And he's a big bear of a guy. And I was over in Soweto with Ruth at the end of last year. And uh, Nick was our host, but we saw him on television one, one day. And uh, he was speaking at a meeting where the president, Nelson Mandela, had just opened a center, a Christian center. And Nick had to give the speech of thanks. Now you know the kind of speech you would make to the president who'd opened your centre. You would say what a good and a godly man he was and how great it was he was protecting the church. And You would bless him in the name of Jesus. Nick didn't. Nick said, Mr. President, we want to thank you for giving us a new South Africa. But we in the church will give you new South Africans to populate it with. Men and women of character and integrity whose lives have been changed by Jesus and therefore will have something to give to this country. Now that's going for it. That's actually telling it as it is. And we need to grapple with this because if you look at the passage uh, that was read by Eric in Judges chapter 6, you'll discover that Gideon was a person just like us. God calls Gideon a mighty warrior. Gideon replies, in words of spiritual confidence and trust. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders? Gideon calls, uh, God calls Gideon a mighty warrior. Gideon replies, but Lord. And you get that in verse 15 of Judges 6. In Exodus 3, you find God calls Moses, promises Moses, God's power. God meets him in a burning bush, but Moses makes excuses, says to God, send someone else. Moses says, I can't speak. God says, who made man's mouth? The excuses are wonderful. We say, but Lord, don't we? God says, go to the USA and serve me, but Lord. Go and share my love in your locality, but Lord. Go and serve me somewhere else in this world, but Lord. Go and be my servant in banking, but Lord. In fact, this is a contradiction in terms. How can we say but and call him Lord? How can you say but Lord? If he's Lord, there aren't any buts. If there's a but, he's not Lord. You can't have the two together. God promises both Gideon and Moses, I will be with you. I'll tell you the secret of these folks up on the platform. It's not that they're terribly good at it, although they are, it's that God's with them. And I'll tell you what that means, it means God bails them out when they make a mistake. It means there's forgiveness, grace and goodness from God. It's exactly the same for you. You don't have to say, but Lord, because if God is with you, he'll never let you down and he'll take you through every situation. We may be small, 
but he is great. If you look in the Old Testament, time and again, it's the hallmark of Christian leadership. I will be with you. It doesn't matter what failure, disappointment, disillusion, or regret you have in your life. You don't say, but Lord. You say, Lord. And then you let him do what he wants. You let him make you what he wants you to be. You let him take you where he wants you to go. Some of you located nice and comfortably in the suburbs. Has God told you to be there? If he has, you stay there because the suburbs need Jesus. If he hasn't, the inner city and the villages need some reinforcement. Has he told you to be in your job? And if you are in that job, are you there as a missionary for Jesus or are you there as an employee for a secular company? I am not talking about being stupid and standing up and trying to do open air preaching uh, in the middle of the work day in the workplace. I'm talking about loving Jesus so much, praying with such intent that you don't divide your life into the secular and the spiritual. You say, yes, Lord, and you go for it wherever he puts you, whatever he gives you to do, every moment of the day, you live in obedience to him. You speak, you share, you pray, you live. You work, you open up opportunities. When the bereaved need a friend, you're there if God tells you to. When someone's dying and needs comfort, you're there if God tells you to. When someone's lonely and needs support, you're there if God tells you to. My daughter Vicky at Theological College will always tell you what her dad's favourite verse in Scripture is. She says it's the one he writes in all my theology books. Because it keeps her feet on the ground. It's John 2 verse 5, do whatever he tells you. It's not but Lord, it's yes Lord. Back in Soweto with Nick Masupi. We were in his car. Soweto is a city of four million blacks, no whites. It's quite a dangerous place to be. The day before we'd seen a guy with a gun in the car next to us. Now we're in the heart of Soweto. We go around a corner and a lady grabs the rear door of the car. Nick and I are in the front, Ruth's in the back. This lady grabs the rear door, dives into the car as we go around this corner. Dives into it next to Ruth. She's inebriated, stoned out of her mind. And as she sits in that car, she says, I am getting into this car because the company will lead me to God. So the company duly stopped the car and Nick led her to Jesus. <laughs> then sent one of his pastors around the next day to bring her into the church. I have waited for years to see that happen. <laughs> it's what happens when God's on a roll. And God gets on a roll when his people are on a roll. It's when his people are doing whatever he tells them to. It's when his people are living in obedience. It's when his people are acting in justice. It's when his people love him and everything they say, do and are belongs to Jesus so he can take them where they are and revolutionise where they are by his love and his power. I don't mind if you're watching this on television and your shell is, bless you, or if you're here tonight, physically in body. Jesus has a role for you. You need to live in obedience. Nick was only driving round a corner God had an appointment, it's a bit like Philip trying to make his way to a good evangelistic crusade and God lands him in the desert for an Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> God's just got ways like that. Nick said to me, do you want to come to our church plant tomorrow? Well, church planting is quite interesting in Soweto because they put up a tent and I like tents as you'll discover tomorrow night. And there we are in this tent the next afternoon, a thousand black faces, Ruth and mine, the only white ones. And uh, Nick introduces me to the pastor, he's the witch doctor. Converted witch doctor. <laughs> and he points to the choir. Now the choir's where they do the follow-up. They're the new converts. Get them converted, stick them in the choir so we can follow them up. Nick says, would you like to bring a greeting? Well, I'd learned my one line of greeting in Zulu. He then said, do you want me to translate for you? Do you want me to interpret? Do you want to say anything? I said, yeah, I'd love to. I said, I like tents. They laughed. I said, we have a Christian convention back home where we get the people into tents. And it's terrific when God moves among us. And uh, a friend of mine, Charles Price, was standing in the biggest tent, the big top one day, and he was preaching. And he preached about a friend who whatever the pain and disillusionment he felt 
would say, for this I have Jesus. Whatever faced him next week would say, for this I have Jesus. However thrilled and blessed he was would say, for this I have Jesus. And however uncertain he was about what he'd done in the past or, or would find in the future would say, for this I have Jesus. My great friend Graham Kendrick, who's a, a singer-songwriter, was sitting next to me. I told these folks in Soweto, and I saw him get his pen out, and I knew what was going to happen. He was going to write a song. And I said to them, look, I'm really sorry as a white for what we whites have done to you for so many years. And I'm really sorry as a Westerner for those of us in the West who prayed for you and have done precious little else. But I guess that for you and for me, the words that Graham wrote that day could be very appropriate this afternoon, I said. Can I read them to you? For the joys and for the sorrows, the best and worst of times. For this moment, for tomorrow, for all that lies behind. Fears that crowd around me for the failure of my plans. For the dreams of all I hope to be, the truth of what I am. For this I have Jesus. For this I have Jesus. For this I have Jesus. I have Jesus. For the tears that flow in secret in the broken times. For the moments of elation or the troubled mind. For all the disappointments or the sting of old regrets, all my prayers and longings that seem unanswered yet, for this I have Jesus, for this I have Jesus, for this I have Jesus, I have Jesus. For the weakness of my body, the burdens of each day, for the nights of doubt and worry when sleep has fled away, needing reassurance and the will to start again, a steely-eyed endurance, the strength to fight and win. For this I have Jesus. For this I have Jesus. For this I have Jesus. I have Jesus. Nick stood up and said, I'm not going to preach. We've heard the word of the Lord. Well, those of you who've got bitterness in your hearts against the whites, resentment against the whites, God's going to forgive you. God's going to heal and cleanse you. Crucified love will reach from Calvary and bring you to Christ. I want you to get out of your seats and come out to the front. Show God you need forgiveness tonight, uh, this afternoon. And the aisles jammed. He said, well, you can't get any nearer, so stretch out your hands to Clive and Ruth. They're the only whites here. Just pray that God will forgive you for the way you felt about the whites. Pray that God will come and cleanse you, bring you his love and his peace and his power, that we may live together in love and harmony, that God may wipe us clean and send us out as messengers of his peace. And the Spirit of God hit the tent. And I have never seen anything like it in my life. As God just moved through that tent. It ended up with one of the black pastors, Benny, and I having a line each of people to pray for for healing. It was an amazing, amazing moment. You see, the secret of the missionary is that you're a prisoner of Jesus, you're a minister of Jesus, and you declare the mystery of Jesus. But the size of the missionary is it doesn't matter if you're little or big. However little you are, God will make you big. If you can't speak like Moses, he'll give you a mouthpiece in error. If you think like Gideon, you can't lead the army, he'll give you the mightiest victory the people had ever seen. If you think you just can't achieve it in what you have, as Paul thought, then God will make you the great apostle, because God's just like that. It doesn't matter what you're like, it's what he's like. And however small you are, he's great. If God took the really naturally gifted and blessed then we'd put it down to human power. If God takes the weak and ordinary, we'll put it down to divine grace, and that's where it belongs. But after the secret of the missionary and the size of the missionary comes the sharing of the missionary. Because Paul doesn't keep reiterating our need to speak out this mystery. Now in verse 9, he speaks of photizo, to enlighten. Jesus met Paul in unsearchable glory on a Damascus road, told him to open their eyes that they might turn from darkness to light, Light is meant to shine in darkness. We're to be a shining people. We're to shine, not just to let Jesus shine, but to let Jesus shine through our lives that the world may see. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read that people took note because they'd been with Jesus. Do you know, I went up to the Butlin's Bakery the other day to get myself a jam donut. I know I shouldn't. <laughs> I know I shouldn't, but I did. I'd got my little daughter Susie with me. That was the reason. And I said to the girl behind the bakery counter, I said, what do you think of our people? She said, well, she said, they're very rude sometimes. 
She said, they don't say please and they don't say thank you and they're a bit curt and abrupt. She said, well, I do like going to the meetings and I thought that African choir was wonderful. I thought, heaven help us. Are we reduced to what's happening on the platforms again? Because it can't be like that. It was last week, so don't blame yourselves. You. Unless you're guilty. But we're there to shine in the darkness. A darkness that can't be blamed for being dark. What do you do? Blame the darkness for being dark or the light for not shining? So Paul says shine in verse 9 and he says in verse 10 that illumination will even reach the cosmic powers. So he goes on because he's warming up in verse 11 to say God is going to use the church to fulfill his eternal purpose to confront supernatural powers that have influenced our world, our government and our society to offer a divine alternative in the light of the glory and truth of God's people on the march. Why I don't think we can shout about homosexuals unless we're prepared to care for people dying of AIDS. That means I don't think we can shout about abortion unless we're prepared to open our homes, extend our families, or welcome the single mum in for Sunday lunch, or at least pray and stand behind those who can do that. We've got to live something, church, not just speak it. Because light's got to shine. We can't do it alone. So in verses 12 and 13 of Ephesians 3, Paul just opens it all up for us. And he just shares with us the fact that we don't have to do it in our strength. We do it in the strength and the confidence that comes from Jesus and from Jesus alone. And how is this possible? I want you to go with me just for a moment to verse 8. It's because of the unsearchable riches of Christ. What are they? Their resurrection from the death of sin. Their reconciliation with God. Their partnership in God's new society. Their membership of the kingdom. Their peace with God. Their access to the Father. Salvation in the Son. Power from the Spirit. Are you getting excited yet? These are too rich to explore. They're inexhaustible, incomprehensible, inexplorable, untraceable, infinite, unfathomable, incalculable, inscrutable, illimitable, inexhaustible. They're our inheritance. That's what God's doing for us. He's got a role for us to be his fighters, to receive his inheritance. We're meant to go and get a world for Jesus. So we need to be, we need to really have within our hearts the secret of the gospel to proclaim, to be prisoners of Christ, ready to be ministers of the glory of God, not looking to ourselves and our own weakness and our own deficiencies, but actually discovering that the sharing of the, of the missionary is taking the power from Christ, having the unsearchable riches of his love within us, God can take you from where you are now, plant you in another culture. God can keep you where you are right now, but actually take you and use you every moment of the day because you're surrendered to him there. God can relocate you or give you a new role here in this country. And I want tonight to challenge you. How many of us is it going to be elsewhere? How many of us are going to go out on a limb? At 48, I feel a bit old to be a missionary, and a missionary to America is a bit odd. But that's fine, because we've got American missionaries over here, like R.T. Kendall doing great jobs of work for us. It's called an exchange. It's called a partnership in the gospel. And we all need to be ready for the role God's got for us, don't we? You did not sound very sure, don't we? Yes. And what it boils down to is whether you really trust him. Whether you trust him to take you where he wants. Whether you trust him to get it right for you. Whether you trust him that he's got it under control. Whether you trust him that he'll work out the implications. Folks, I want to finish, but I want to conclude. There are some of you here from Afro-Caribbean backgrounds, and I'm going to need your help. You're going to have to forgive me because of the colour of my skin. But I need to say that preaching to a black congregation is much easier than preaching to a white one. Because they tell you how you're doing. <laughs> when you get the first Amen, you know you're moving. And when it gets to glory, you're really making progress. When it's Hallelujah, you're hitting something. And when it's preach it, you know you're beginning to get the rafters going. That's wonderful. When you're dying, then the black mamas will wave their white hankies and go, help him, Jesus. <laughs> and the signer is going to have to forgive me for this. Because I want to close with the words of a black preacher, S.M. Lockridge, in a message delivered in Detroit when he simply wanted to underline one thing, that you can trust Jesus. That wherever he wants you to go, whatever he wants you to be, 
You may say, I'm 80, I'm too old. God called Moses at 80. You may say, I'm 16, I'm too young. Well, that was about the time that the disciples were getting ready to go off. Teens and 20s. You haven't got many excuses, folks. Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your character, doesn't matter your caliber. Some of you are thinking of early retirement. Amen. You may have a very unusual early retirement. God has got things for his people. We are not in a day and we are not in a generation when we can afford to play footsie with God. We've got to trust him. Lockridge said this. He's the one who made us. It was he who made us and not we ourselves. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. No means of measure can define his limitless love and no far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. I'm telling you today, you can trust him. Amen. Not very good, are they? No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He's enduringly strong and is entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast and is immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful and is impartially merciful. He's the greatest phenomenon that's ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's the sinner's saviour. He's the centrepiece of civilization. I'm trying to tell you, church, you can trust him. He doesn't have to call for help and you can't confuse him. He doesn't need you and he doesn't need me. He stands alone in the solitude of himself. He's august and unique and he's unparalleled, he's unprecedented, he's supreme, he's preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem of higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of the spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good you can call him. I'm trying to tell you, you can trust him. He heals the sick, he cleanses the leper, he forgives sinners, he discharges debtors, he delivers the captives, he defends the feeble, he blesses the young, he regards the aged, he rewards the diligent, he beautifies the meek. I'm trying to tell you, church, you can trust him. He's the key to knowledge, he's the wellspring to wisdom, he's the doorway to deliverance, he's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway to glory. You can trust him. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of legislators. He's the overseer of overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. And you can trust him. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable because he's incomprehensible. He's irresistible because he's invincible. You can't get him off your hands. You can't get him off your mind. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Pilate couldn't stand it when he found out he couldn't stop him. And Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And thank God the grave couldn't hold him. There was nobody before him. And there'll be nobody after him. He has no predecessor. And he'll have no successor. You can't impeach him. And he's not going to resign. You can trust him. Sometimes God likes to underline things. Something occurred to me. <laughs> they were underlined, weren't they? Yes. Well, here's a bit more underlining. While Clive was preaching, something came to me. Uh, 
another glimpse of our beloved Lord Jesus looking at us and saying, I have given you grace upon grace, one encouragement after another. I have strengthened you, I have forgiven you, I've lifted up you up time after time after time. I have given you my salvation, I've given you my word. And I will tell you why I have done these things in your lives time after time. Firstly, because I love you. Because I love you. Another reason is this. I want you to be strong and have a good courage to follow me because in my heart I am a missionary. I am the God of the nations and I intend to walk out into my world and cast out the usurper who has caused so much damage to my people in my world. And I want to strengthen you so that you can follow me. And I invite you to come with me and a vast company of angels to drive out the usurper, to bring light where there is darkness, to bring healing where there is sickness, to bring deliverance where there is oppression. One serious thing I must say. Remember my word, if you do not warn the wicked to turn from his evil way, that wicked one will die in his sin, but his blood will I require at your hands. These are serious things, and yet there is mercy. If there is blood on your hands through your negligence, it can be cleansed away. As you ask my forgiveness, I grant it to you, but I make a condition that you stand with me and walk with me to warn the wicked to turn from their evil ways. Then we shall see heaven soar. Then we shall see the world renewed. Joy will fill my heart. Joy will fill your heart. And my enemy shall be cast down and trampled under our feet. Who then will join me, the missionary, the evangelist, moving out into my world? winning my souls. God's a missionary God. God's a God who speaks. And God's a God who's spoken clearly to us tonight. As Clive was ministering, he kept using this phrase, a prisoner of the Lord. And for some of you as he was speaking, it was like it was suddenly dawning on you, hey, that's what I am. I'm not a prisoner of my boss and I'm not a prisoner of my job. I'm not a prisoner of my circumstances, nor am I a prisoner of the devil. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. If God spoke to you tonight, as Clive brought that, would you stand in your place? You see, you see, you are a prisoner of the Lord. Would you stand in your seat right now? And that's what you want to be, a prisoner of the Lord, of Him and no one else. Look at this. Thank you, Lord. A prisoner of the Lord. When Paul wrote that, the book of Philippians said he was chained day and night to the Roman jailers. Can you imagine those poor guys having to be chained next to Paul? You're giving them the gospel day and look at this. I want you, I mean, we're going to take this in three sections. Clive, come and pray for the people. Would you come and pray for the people? When you see you're the prisoner of the Lord, nothing stops the power of God working in your life. Nothing. We're going to take this, the first section, and pray for you in here. There's an anointing in here tonight that will change your understanding of your purpose so that when you work into your workplace, when you live in your neighborhood, you know that you're there, not because you chose it, but because you're God's prisoner, a prisoner of the Lord, called to be an ambassador for Him in His chains, but full of His presence and His purpose. Lord, you know where we are. 
you know where we work, you know what we do, you know our homes and you know our families. And you know the pressures that we face. And you know it's ever so easy to say something here in these walls and very hard to be it when we walk out the gates. That's why we are enormously grateful to you tonight that you don't call us to be a prisoner, but a prisoner of Jesus. That's why we're so grateful that you call us to be in bondage to you, that you might give us what we need to live, that you might give us by your spirit what we need to be changed, that you might give us by your spirit what we need to say, that you might give us the assurance that you'll forgive our failures, diminish our weaknesses, increase our strengths, enlarge us by your spirit, that we might pour out our lives as living sacrifices for you, and that it might be worthy of you, not because of who we are, but what you make us to be. Lord, we very simply say to you tonight, we belong to you, we surrender to you. Lord, crucify us with yourself, but set a guard at the foot of the cross that we may not come down again, because we want to stay there, belonging to you, totally belonging to you. Lord, you're going to call us to more things, Please, 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 Lord, do not allow us to stop halfway. As your people in this nation, we've stopped halfway for so long and we've seen so much. Lord, we want to go further and further and further and further, giving more and more and more until your heart is delighted by a captive people to your will who, because they've found the truth, have found freedom. Why is it, Lord, that when we actually become your captives, we truly find freedom? Lord, make us your prisoners tonight. Set us free to change our world. In Jesus' name.